Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so we're here to talk about open source at NVIDIA, um, how we use open source software, how we contribute to open source software, and how we modify open source software to meet our needs. Um, a little bit about me. Um, uh, my name is Dirk Van Gelder. I just joined NVIDIA, so I'm a newbie, and I'm trying to learn as we go. Um, but before that, I was an engineering lead at Pixar Animation Studios for uh, 23 years. Um, but very excited to be here with you today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of open source and computer graphics, because it used to be really hard to do. Um, when I started uh, at Pixar in the 90s, um, when Steve Jobs ran the company, um, a lot of the studios, you know, the, the full proprietary code stacks were considered a competitive advantage. Um, you know, you wanted to lock away your intellectual property, your patents, um, and you wanted to keep that to yourself because that was what was considered to give you an edge. Um, so we gave, we, we made a lot of cool technology, but it was really hard to share that with other people. We couldn't talk about it with our coworkers at other companies, and that felt kind of isolating. Um, so I led uh, Pixar's first open source project, OpenSubdiv, um, and it was really hard to figure out what we do with the patents, what we do with licenses, and what it even means. And it was, you know, we, we managed to get through that and get it out there, um, but it was, it was harder. And now it's much easier to do. You see open source software in every place in computer graphics. Uh, visual effects studios are running on open source operating systems and packages across the board. Um, and now we have a, an Academy Software Foundation, um, which runs this for us. And I think it's, uh, it's a very cool development. It was not always like this. Um, and it's pretty psyched. I'm pretty psyched that it is the way it is. Now, if you want to use open source software, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things you might want to do. Um, one of those is licenses. Now, this is review for a lot of people on this call, but just in case um, to talk about these things. Some licenses are permissive. Uh, uh, some software could come with a BSD, an MIT, or Apache license. Um, those are pretty equivalent. Apache says some things about patents. Uh, I believe the Academy Software Foundation is trying to standardize on you know, something around Apache. Um, and those generally, if you're at a company who knows who, who has a pipeline for this set up, if you have software with one of these licenses, you can just ask and go through a process and use it, and that's fantastic. Um, the software I work on, Omniverse, has over 100 open source license, licenses included within it. But there are some things to watch out for. Um, some of the licenses are more restrictive, like the GNU public license and the lesser GNU public license. The GNU public license says things about if you use software with a GPL license, then your own software uh, is, is, needs to be open source. Um, the LGPL doesn't say that, but it says some other things. So um, if you do want to use open source software and it has one of those licenses, be very sure to ask at your company um, what that means and make sure that that's cleared before you use it um, just to avoid complications um, with a disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer, but these are just things to keep in mind. Um, now, one question is, why would NVIDIA want to use open source, want to contribute to open source software? Why is that important? Now, the thing is, um, you know, we make platforms and we make chips and we make a whole bunch of other things, but we want to empower developers to use them. And so if you're using a chip that has several thousand cores on it and you want to run the software on it, that's hard to do. Um, that takes a lot to do. So we want to give developers software to be able to get the best use out of their GPUs and particularly to use their latest features. When we roll out a feature, we wanna have open source software that backs that feature so that people can learn how to use it and really take advantage of the GPU to their best abilities, the GPU's best abilities and their best abilities. So I'm going to talk about a couple of contributions that, um, open, that NVIDIA has made to open source, but note on the bottom of the slide there, developer.nvidia.com slash open dash source, uh, almost all of the software packages that we're gonna talk about today are listed on that page and their GitHub links are there um, and includes their open source licenses. So if you wanna find out more, please do go there and, and, and find out um, what those things are. Now the first category is deep learning. Deep learning is a really important market for NVIDIA. This is, you wanna have a data center with thousands of GPUs spinning up, crunching a bunch of data and training neural networks to learn about that data and do things with it. Um, so these are all software, open source software packages that NVIDIA has created or contributed to that allow you to do deep learning. Um, another area is containers. Um, we've made contributions to container runtimes to enable NVIDIA GPUs to work with these containers. Uh, we didn't invent Docker or Kubernetes, but we've made contributions to help them run with NVIDIA GPUs because that's very important in data centers in particular. 
um, design and visualization. Uh, remember these two, uh, material definition language is one of our contributions and universal scene description is a contribution by Pixar. Uh, we're gonna come back to these and talk about these in more detail in a little bit. Autonomous vehicles, uh, we have our physics simulation engine, which is super cool, a GPU simulation where you can have thousands of objects uh, simulating in real time. I've been playing with that recently. Um, in addition, uh, we have image classification. Image classification means as you have an autonomous vehicle that's driving around, you have to recognize like where's the what's a fire hydrant, what's a stop sign, what's another car, what's a pedestrian. So these are libraries that use artificial intelligence to help classify what's in the camera sensor that's coming to an autonomous vehicle and help that vehicle reason about what's in front of it. Similarly with Redtail, uh, Redtail is for autonomous mobile robotics, um, but that allows perception and AI contributions uh, for autonomous mobile robotics. High performance computing, um, you know, if you want to take those thousands of CUDA cores on your NVIDIA GPU and you want to crunch numbers with it, we want to give you the math libraries to help you crunch those numbers without writing every single bit of low level code yourself. We want to give you libraries that allow you to get best GPU utilization so that your, your methods run as fast as possible. Uh, high performance computing. And research, this is where it gets kind of wild. A, a lot of the research, I wasn't aware of all the research that happens at NVIDIA. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple examples today. Um, one example that I'm going to talk about is Gogan um, at the bottom, uh, image generation with generative adversarial neural networks, and also Kowlin uh, inverse graphics. So let me jump in here. So what we're just what we're showing here is a video about Gogan. Um, so again, what this does is use um, generative adversarial neural networks, literally neural networks that are fighting with each other, uh, which sounds amazing to be able to take that segmentation map on the left and say that color brown is rock. And it's been trained on gazillions of pictures of nature about what rock looks like. So it knows if you put brown there, I'm gonna figure out what rock is and I'm gonna put rock in that scene um, using artificial intelligence. Here, I'm gonna, put a rock, I'm gonna put a rock on the left-hand side. And it knows that that rock needs to reflect in the water, um, even though you didn't tell it to reflect in the water. It's just looked at lots of pictures of rocks and water and it knows that there's reflection there. Um, similarly, for the vegetation that's added, uh, for the clouds in the sky, all the images on the right side are generated by a neural network. Um, it knows what mountains look like and it knows that mountains reflect in water. And it knows here when you add snow into this particular scene that the sky should look different because it's been trained on images of the sky. I'm going to talk about another one here. Um, this is an application which has been trained. You see these pictures of cars on the left hand side. It's never been shown a 3D model of a car. Uh, this is with the library Kowlin. It's only been shown lots and lots and lots of pictures of cars. And from that, it's figured out how to make a 3D model of a car. Um, this is a process called inverse graphics. Graphics is the process where you take a 3D geometry and then from that 3D geometry, you create a 2D image. Inverse graphics is create, taking a 2D image and generating 3D geometry from it. This takes advantage of a differential renderer to be able to render things and learn when you render an object in 3D what that does to the image such that it can invert that. Um, this is from the research department led by Sanja uh, Fiedler and it's just amazing that the work, it just seems like magic. Like how can you take a picture of the side of a car and make the back of it because the computer knows what cars are. Um, so. Eventually, I hope to understand this stuff, but I find it fascinating to see um, and to watch. Literally magic, well, maybe not literally. Um, so one other thing that happens is you saw that segmentation map where there was different colors that showed the pieces of the car. So this is generating a segmentation map. It knows what parts the windshield and what's the hood and what's the tire and what's the front headlight. And thus it generates on the 3D model a segmentation of that 3D model into different parts. And you can take advantage of that in order to generate different materials for those different parts. Excuse me. So you need, you know, you need to know that the windshield is made of glass and you need to know that the headlight is made of glass, but the hood is not. And those segmentation maps are generated by the AI technology from NVIDIA research that is open source in order to do that. So now I'm going to talk about something. Um, if you saw Ken Youssef talk this morning, um, Nano VDB is a package that was released in open source today by NVIDIA at 10 a.m. 
Um, this is uh, OpenVDB is a package developed by Ken um, at Digital Domain and DreamWorks and Weta to be able to take volumes and describe and process those volumes. And NanoVDB is a way of taking those OpenVDB volumes and turn them into something that's a contiguous block of memory that's very GPU friendly. It's a contiguous block of memory with very few dependencies so that it can really crank on the GPU and do real-time ray tracing. Here we have work by Andrew, uh, Andrew Riedmeier, which is taking open nano VDB as a source and then feeding it into a fluid sim called Flow on the GPU. So this is all enabled by nano VDB, um, released as open source today. Um, one thing I really like about nano VDB is that it's just a single header. Um, you can use it without any dependencies. And so it's, when, when it says nano, it is really small and lightweight. Um, and um, it enables you to do these things. Um, so we're pretty psyched to contribute nano VDB to the open source community. Um, this may be one too many armadillos, but I can't get enough of watching these clouds uh, float off this armadillo um, in real time. Now one more example. So this is not um, tracing, this is tracing a volume, but it's, tr it's generating surfaces from that volume um, in real time. And this is 2.2 billion voxels. So nano VDB gives you the ability to do real-time ray tracing um, at interactive frame rates, almost independent of the underlying complexity of the scene. Um, this is all real-time recorded, um, recorded off someone's desktop. So please do check out nano VDB uh, contribution. Now I'm gonna, I told you I was gonna come back to the material definition language. So um, MDL is a language which describes how light interacts with surfaces. It does that um, with um, energy conserving BSDFs and very well understood physically based properties so that we can define physically based materials and really understand how light interacts with them. Um, it was started in 2011, but has now become open source as of 2018 with a BSD license. Um, so some of the nice things about the material definition language are that because we have a well understood, we really understand how light interacts with these surfaces and how these surfaces, how these surface materials work, we can have standardization among different renderers. So we can generate something for, inter, for real time rasterizing, interactive ray tracing and path tracing, and really know how they agree with each other, a consistent look because of these energy conserving BSDFs. So model defines how the light interacts with the surface in a language, in a C-like language. Um, so it's a, this is a, you know, it's a blob of C-like language which describes, uh, it's a program. Now I'm gonna jump away from MDL and then jump right back to it. I'm gonna talk about USD. This is Universal Scene Description um, developed by Pixar Animation Studios. Um, I may be biased, but I think it's really awesome. Um, and we're very grateful for, the, for Pixar for contributing this to open source and continuing to put the effort that they do into USD. Um, it's built, it's the, it's the culmination of several decades worth of representations for 3D worlds and how you have hundreds of people collaborating on a film, all collaborating on a different parts of that world and how you do interchange among different applications um, and how you do that really scalably, how you have really complicated worlds flow from one place to another within Pixar and that is open sourced um, and it's gaining widespread support in, in many DCC apps and other production studios and we're pretty psyched about it. NVIDIA is all in on USD. We think it's the bomb and you know, we just wanna use it. Um, it's being used throughout the company. Uh, the project that I'm working on, Omniverse, is based around USD um, and you know, we're psyched, USD is great. And just to come back to, to Muddle, to MDL. So this is how you would take MDL and embed it inside of USD. So here we have a program written in MDL, this NVIDIA slash core definitions dot MDL. And that is embedded in a shader and a material inside of USD. So this becomes a node inside of USD that interacts with your renderer. So USD for us becomes a place where you can encapsulate many different open source, uh, open source and not open source nodes inside of a 3D world. It becomes a gathering place for many different technologies. And we think that that's a pretty sweet uh, property. Um, and there's a link on the bottom of the page if you'd like to know more about that. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about USD and Hydra and what they do and how we use them. So Hydra is the rendering architecture that's included as part of USD. And so USD is the definition of the scene. Hydra is the architecture which can take that scene definition and render it and produce pixels on the back end. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about Hydra particularly um, and USD and what we've been doing to modify those and enhance those 
for our, our work within NVIDIA. So one of the things we noticed is that USD, you know, you can go to one app and save USD and go to another and load it, but it also gives us the opportunity to collaborate among multiple, among multiple users and multiple apps interactively in real time. So um, I'm going to show you an example where, we, where one can take Rhino 3D, 3D Studio Max, and Revit, and using USD and our Nucleus server, um, be able to communicate with, uh, with Omniverse interactively while you work using the standard definition of the 3D world that USD provides us. So here again, we're going to talk about um, three different apps. We're going to talk about Rhino 3D, we're going to talk about uh, 3D Studio Max and Revit, and how those things can use USD and Omniverse Nucleus Server to communicate and give us real-time path tracing. Um, so this is the Soho Tower in Beijing. It's a beautiful building. And the images that you're seeing here are generated in real time in Omniverse. They're real time ray tracing representations of that building. Now we want to give artists working in, so here with Rhino, you have someone shaping Rhino on the left and then bringing it into Omniverse on the right and showing how light plays across that scene. Similarly here, we have an artist who is moving buildings around in 3D Studio Max and in real time communicating with Omniverse to be able to see how the light plays. And then we also have um, this is in Revit, someone putting buildings, someone putting desks and computers, and then seeing in Omniverse on the right how the light plays across the scene interactively. So this is an example of interactive collaboration through USD and the Nucleus server with Omniverse. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how getting real-time response, getting rapid response and real-time response from USD and Hydra. So this is a description of, of USD as it exists in the open source repo. So you have USD on the left, your scene, and you change an attribute, say you change a color. That's gonna send a notice over to USD imaging, which is the scene delegate, um, which gathers together all the information about changing things in USD, and through an intermediate data structure called the render index, communicates to the render delegate, which renders the picture. Now that's the normal path, that's great, but it's not super fast if you change thousands of attributes all at the same time. Um, and so if you wanted to change thousands of attributes all at the same time and get really fast updates, you would need something like this. Um, other people have done this. Animal Logic has a custom scene delegate that they use, um, as well as Autodesk in their uh, Maya application. And P Pixar has done this internally as well, custom scene delegates for fast response. So here we use USD as the definition of the world. It is the ground truth of what exists on the world, where all the objects are, where all the materials are. That's defined by USD. Now that static scene is, is, is given to USD imaging and it's given to our physics engine and the physics engine takes that definition of the world and, you know, understands, oh, this is what I need to do to run my physics. And then it starts running its physics and say 5,000 objects start falling from the sky. Physics is communicating with the Omniverse scene delegate through a fast path. We have a, a, a set of data structures that are really fast at sending all of that data into the Omniverse scene delegate. The Omniverse scene delegate here acts like an overlay on top of USD imaging for the attributes that we know are changing really rapidly. And so in that way, we get real-time updates with Omniverse as an extension to, um, to USD and Hydra. Now, another thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to use Vulkan and DirectX 12. Now, this is open source Hydra as it exists. USD commutes to, communicates to the scene delegate. We've cracked open those render delegates and shown that we have a PR man, Storm, and Emery render delegate in there. And the entity that wraps those up is a Hydra engine. And the Hydra engines and the open source repo have OpenGL dependencies. Um, Hydra started out entirely as an, open, uh, as an OpenGL thing. And Pixar has been working to reduce the OpenGL dependencies in Hydra, which is awesome. Um, we're not totally there yet, but we see the progress. Um, but we wanted to jump in and really get going with Vulkan and DirectX 12. So in order to do that, we have uh, a, a separate Hydra engine that is customized for Vulkan and DirectX 12 to work with our Omniverse scene delegate and our Omniverse render delegate. This is so that we can pass down command queues and fill up those command queues with all of the commands necessary to draw the scene. We've abstracted away some of the Vulkan and DirectX 12 dependencies there so that the code can work with both of those. But it required a customized Hydra engine um, and, and that's the way that we accomplished that. And then we have another Hydra engine um, which is based on OpenGL for the existing render delegates. Now, there's an asterisk there because this is all work that's in progress. Um, Omniverse is the, is the encapsulation of a number of technical prototypes and experiments that we've done 
to figure out how to get best performance out of Hydra and USD. And what we're trying to do now is take those things and refactor them into a structure that gives us, um, that, that allows us to interchange, that allows us to use different render delegates, that allows us to use our own render delegate, allows us to use real-time updates with the Omniverse scene delegate and do that in a way that's well-structured. Um, I personally hope that this also allows us to create a contribution that we can give back to the open source community, but we're not committing to that, but that's what I personally hope um, we'll end up with. So I wanted to show you an example of what happens when all of these pieces come together. Um, so this is a marbles demo that we did for GTC 2020. Um, as you'll see, this is running on a single person's desktop in real time, um, showing uh, physics, showing real time ray tracing, um, and um, a number of artists uh, contributed to this work and it really shows off what we're able to achieve in a system that is built around open source software. Uh, open source software is the core here um, and it's an open standard and we wanna support that and build upon that in ways that allow you to make a complex uh, interactive worlds. Um, here you can see uh, somebody running the game live. This is all live. None of this is uh, baked out and rendered. And so this is the work that we're doing. It's definitely a work in progress, um, but we wanna to continue to refine these things to be able to best take advantage of Hydra and USD um, in real time with real time ray tracing. Now, um, this is all stuff that we're, you know, this is all stuff that we're working on, as we said, and if you're working on similar things, please do reach out to us. Um, you know, if you're doing Vulkan with Hydra, you're trying to do real time things with Hydra, real time ray tracing, um, USD interaction, um, we'd love to chat. You know, this is, um, it's open source and let's all be a community and talk about it um, because that's a thing that I'm very excited to do. Um, <clears throat> this is the end of our presentation. I, I do want to thank the uh, Academy Software Foundation and the Linux Foundation for putting together such a sweet uh, set of presentations today and yesterday. Um, it's just nice to see the community get together um, and be able to talk about open source software in this way and to be able to have the visual effects and animation community in particular um, be a strong member of that community. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. We have the esteemed Ryan Stelzleni on our Slack chat. Um, and um, if there are any questions, uh, we'd be, we still have a few minutes to answer them. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm gonna stop sharing and then go over to here. And then let's see, we have 86 people, which is very cool. Oh, Larry Gritz. Hi, Larry. Nice to see you. Let's, I'm just going to read Larry's thing because Larry's awesome. I worked with Larry back in the day, and um, I think he's amazing. Derek, an important GLT, G, GPL subtlety. It's not the case that you, if you use GPL software that you are obligated to open source your package. It's that you are only permitted to redistribute a combined package of your code and the GPL code if the whole thing is licensed under GPL. If you aren't redistributing the software outside your company, e.g. an internal tool, you are under no such obligation. But one reason to be wary of GPL code is that you may think today that you have no interest in redistributing your combined tool. But if later you change your mind and want to turn it into an op a commercial or open source app, the use of GPL software is internal, internal to it may, may, be the, may limit the means and licenses that you can distribute it. So when in doubt with open source software, listen to Larry Gritz and thank you, Larry. And uh, let's see, is there any other chat? How exciting. Uh, it seems rather quiet. I hope I didn't bore you all to death or say things that are completely obvious. Oh, there's a question in the QA. Where's well, the QA? Oh, where does MDL fit in with Material X? That's a good question. Um, I think that there are a number of developments, I believe, happening uh, with Material X as a standard to be able to have Material X work with things like Muddle and OSL and other things. Um, I don't. I can't speak to those at the moment. Um, I believe Pixar is working on these things, and other people are. So I believe that um, there is something coming where Material X and Muddle can work together, um, but uh, I can't speak to that myself because it's not an area of expertise for me personally. Um, I think Material X is great, um, by the way. It's so quiet. Hmm. 
and I think um, if there are no questions, um, I think if there are no questions, there is a, uh, a, a, a open source days NVIDIA channel on the ASWF Slack. Um, so please, if you have any questions, uh, please go there and ask away on the Slack channel. Thank you very much for coming today.